All right, we are live. Hey everyone, hope you are doing well. Happy Thursday. Um, today, we are having another guest on the Shift Success podcast. Uh, I'm joined by one of our clients and friends. Uh, he is a former police officer, and now he is obviously turned into an entrepreneur. And he's going to be sharing his story from going from police officer to entrepreneur, and uh, basically giving some lots of business lessons and tips along the way. So ladies and gentlemen, Jamie Foister. Jamie, how are you? Hello, I'm good. I'm good. All good. How are you? All right. Good stuff. Yeah, I'm very well. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for your time. So, uh, Jamie, one of the uh, first things I'd like to ask everyone who joins the podcast is, uh, who is Jamie Foyce? What are you like? Uh, where are you from? What was you like growing up as a kid? <laughs> um, so I'm, I live in Suffolk. I've been in Suffolk all my life. Um, who am I? Blimey. Um, I lived a fairly normal childhood, to be fair. Um, fairly routine. I went through sixth form, went to college, did the college, um, went to uni, but ended up dropping out of uni, too much passing. Um, so yeah, I mean, as a child, I was, I was overweight as a child, which may mean why I'm where I am today in the fitness industry, actually, but I was overweight as a child. I was, um, I was bullied as a child for being overweight. So it was quite a sore point for me. Um, and yeah, since, since then, since then I've sort of, got on and into the fitness industry from there really um from actually losing that weight in my sort of teen years that's where my interest perked but yeah fairly routine childhood um yeah nothing you, out of the ordinary was you mischievous was you academic growing up uh I, I a bit of both to be fair um I was shy, I was shy initially then as i grew as a teenager i sort of come out of my shell um start to express my opinions a bit more, start to socialise a bit more, was more interactive. But that took a while to come out. Um, it didn't come out naturally. Sort of mm. just had to work on it and um, work on my engagement with people. And uh, I've come a long way since sort of a 14-year-old lad who was uh, shy in their bedroom playing on the Xbox every week, that's for sure. Yeah, I can imagine. So talk to me about uh, you being overweight. So... Um... You was overweight and you said that you, you was being bullied. Was that a primary school, secondary school or? Yes, yeah, so it started in primary school. Um, my dad used to feed me salami and eat damn cheese quite regularly. Um, <laughs> now, they're not very good for anyone watching this. They're not very good for you. Um, high in fat and I, I piled on weight um, that much so that I used to play football for my Sunday league team. And the coach said, Jamie, you need to lose some weight. Um, you need to lose some weight to play. It was that bad. The coach had to say that. But that actually pushed me to do something about it. Um, and from there, I lost the weight. But it started in primary school. And, uh, I was a bit sensitive. And, uh, yeah, I was sensitive all the way through with it, really. But I noticed a massive difference when I lost that weight. Even as a child, I noticed a massive difference in my confidence and my personality and how I felt about myself. I believe that that doesn't change if you're a child mm. or you're in your 50s, 60s. If you lose a considerable amount of weight, you feel a hell of a lot better about yourself. Mm. Yeah. With the work, when you were uh, when you were being bullied, was it was it physical? Was it just name calling? I'll say just name calling, but is it was it something else? Just just name calling, just name calling. But it gets you at any age, you know. Mm. It does. It gets you at any age. So yeah, it got to me. I just wasn't. You know, as a child, you don't really know what to do about it. You know, you don't know much about losing weight or anything. It's just one of those things. You, but yeah, I, I changed, and from them, from them comments from my football coach, you know, my mum looks at it, looks at what I was eating. You know, could see it was affecting me. Changed my diet, all for the better. Made me the person I am now. Um, if I hadn't have changed, I don't know what path I'd be on, to be honest. But it brought out my personality. It yeah. brought out me i guess yeah what was the defining moment where you went you know enough was enough and how old was you at this point um it's probably about 12 about 12 years old 13 years old when when um we actually started changing things and started looking at things from that light and uh yeah it, it was uh, it was those comments from the football coach at 12 13 years old where i thought right, okay well let's do something about it I mentioned it to my mum yeah, my mum says, let's look at it, you know, it's making me unhappy, let's look at it. And uh, we went from there. 
of course. And I suppose at that age, you know, you're going into puberty, you know, maybe attraction of girls, you're starting to be aware of them now as well. I'm sure that came into it as well. Um, how, you know, once you made that decision, was it literally a case of just watching what you eat with the support of mum and dad? Or was you working out then? Funny enough, I was burning so many calories because I was active. It was very sporty, so I love playing football. I'd play football every day. So I was burning loads of calories. So it was just a case of getting off the salami and eat um, cheese, <laughs> which, funny enough, my fat content obviously went down considerably. My calories reduced because of changing food. Um, so not, not tracking consumption or anything elaborate. It was just a case of change what you eat. Calories shot down. The macros in them calories changed. And my body changed, you know, changed quite drastically and quite quickly. Cool. Okay. So you're going, obviously, 12, 13 now, you're starting to get in better shape. Uh, and of course, you go through secondary school. Uh, and then you mentioned you, you, you went to uni. What, first of all, what did you decide to do at uni? So I studied, I studied strength and conditioning at university at Twickenham. Um, I didn't last the first year. Um, just too much socialising, I guess, um, not really knowing what direction I want to go in with it, um, not really having a firm belief it was going to lead to a, a career at the end of it. I just never, I never threw myself in. I have to be 110% in something for it to work. I just wasn't. Um, mm. So, yeah, that, that was an experience. It's a good experience, but I well, think you have to be committed and know your path and direction clearly um, when you go to university. Yeah, I completely agree. And what was kind of the incentive, what was the decision to go in the first place? Was it because your friends are going or or was it, you know, mum and dad encouraging you? You know what, I, I, I had no direction. I had no, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I always wanted to work in sport and potentially in football, just in the, in the general fitness and sport industry, but I didn't know how to do it. Um, there was no set path. And unfortunately, it's still, I never had the opportunity to sit down with someone and say, but they never asked me what you want to do and how you're going to get there. Um, if I'd have had that conversation, I might have been on a different path because I think everyone should have that opportunity and be told what they need to do to be who they want to be. But you know, that just didn't happen. So I just I just went on a whim, to be honest, initially. Okay. So you decided you're in uni. It's not for you anymore. Uh, how did you tell mum and dad? How did you tell people around you that you were dropping out? Um, well, I actually applied to be a... Uh, deputy manager at uh, my local sports centre in my local town Beckles in Suffolk and um, I got that while I was still on the uni course um, I got I got accepted past the interview and I thought well I'll take it you know I'll take it I moved into that and thought well I'll do that and, and see what happens I still didn't have a clear direction of what I wanted to do but it was in the industry I wanted to be in and i would work it out from there so they were they were fine a bit. You know, I was going into employment. I was going into a job. I wasn't just leaving on a whim. It was, um, mm. yeah, low road change. There was no there was no arguments over that. Great. And how old are you at this point? Sorry. Uh, so I was 20, 21. I went to uni a bit later. Um, yep. Had a couple of years of just being in the doldrums of not knowing what to do between sixth form and uh, uni, as most people do. But yep. um, cool. yeah, so about twenty one. Okay, so 21 years old, you've got this new job. Um, what was it kind of like being in the job for the first time? Uh, you know, having uh, been paid a wage for the first time, did you experience anything uh, daunting about that? Or um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed what I was doing because it was along the lines of what I, what I wanted to do. I was personal training there, was sort of, you know, mm -hmm. managing at a, at a level and uh, it, was, it was within sport. So... Being, being paid was interesting. My money management was terrible back then. Um, mm. Nothing like it is now. It wasn't very good. I'd spend what I got. I'd, I'd have nothing left. So just on that hamster wheel as such. Yeah. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. But it's easy to just sit back and just continue in that, in that, in those motions for years and years. There, there come a time in that where I thought well, I need to move on and uh, progress my life from here. Cool. So how long was you in that job for? Um, couple of years okay. three years three years i think um and that's the point where i thought well i need to do there was no opportunity to progress in there and i always like to progress with what i do and there, there was no opportunity it was uh that was the baseline of what i was going to do mm. and that to me just didn't see it and so i got itchy feet and moved on um 
and then I moved on to the control room um, for Suffolk Constabulary at that time. Um, got a job there and left and switched over to, to be a controller for them. Cool, cool. And in the control room, was you a dispatcher? Was you doing something else? Yeah, as a dispatcher, call taker. Um, it's a dual role these days, so you do a bit of both. But um, yeah, and uh, it was a massive change for me, you know, just out of the blue. My um, my brother works, still works in the control room. Um, so I thought, well, I'll give that a go and see what that's like. So Awesome. Okay, and how did you find that job, first of all? Because I'm assuming, you know, you, I'm assuming you get these emergency calls coming through. You've got to remain calm and, you know, direct the people on the phone what to do and obviously speaking to cops. Talk to me a bit about that. How did you find that job and, and what was it like? I found it, I found it interesting. It was a, it was a completely different um, pace of life, I guess. The demand was more, um, you know, you were straight on it. And, yeah, it was, it developed me as a person, for sure. There's certain skills you need to be a controller. You need to be very switched on and have great communication with people. And um, it gave me experiences that, yeah, have benefited me in life in general. Um, but again, I, I got itchy feet in that job. Um, you know, I wanted more from that. I saw the jobs coming in and stuff, but you only get a background of them. And I wanted more, which obviously led me to becoming a police officer myself. But mm. yeah, hectic, but a good sort of stress, you know, a healthy stress mm. that was. Cool. Okay. So the transition from being in the control room to a police officer, what was the incentive to, to become a police officer? Was was it again progression or was it because you want some action or what was it? I wanted a bit more. Um, I wanted a bit of the action, I guess. I wanted a bit of uh, adrenaline. Um, yeah, just a bit more. Just I got, I got fed up of sitting there and just talking to people and just keep going in and sitting at a desk. I didn't like it. Um, so yeah, and yeah, I went, I went there, got, got in, was delighted. I can remember getting in, still remember it. Similar to my, my first sale in business, you know, that delight, was ecstatic. Um, and yeah, it was all good. It was, it was all good for that at that time, yeah. Great stuff. And, and you obviously got in first time, is that right? No, no, oh. second time. Um, I failed my board on the first one. Um, I never watched the news. I don't like watching the news. Um, there was a question about what's going on in the news. I, I had no idea because um, I don't watch it. Um, and yeah, I failed on that. So I had to do it again and uh, got through. Just Amazing stuff. So what, how old are you at this point when you joined as a police officer? Uh, so as a police officer, I would have been 20, 25. 20, okay. 25, yeah. So, pr- so pretty young. And, and what was what was that like? What was kind of the, uh, kind of your, one of your first shifts? How was that? Really enjoyed it. You know, um, I policed in Lowestoft when I came out of training school. Um, for anyone who knows Lowestoft, it's horrible. It's uh, <laughs> it's not a nice place. It's um, It used to be, but not these days. And it was busy and hectic. Um, but I really enjoyed it. The, the people you meet in the police are top people. They really are. And uh, there's some talented people in there. And, uh, yeah, I mean, my first shift, we had a roll around uh, it was, it was just chaos, you know, just a blur. It was everything I wanted, everything I pictured. Um, and for the first couple of years, that was great, but that soon wears off. Um, mm. And mm. yeah, eventually, it's, I guess the toll of the job and everything that's wrong with the job comes out, and it come up pretty early for me. I, I highlighted it fairly early. Um, it's when I found you. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, I, I knew, whilst I loved the job, I really find it, I found it enjoyable. There was too many issues with it, unfortunately. Mm. Okay. So what was kind of your first arrest? What was one of the, uh, can you remember your first arrest? Yeah, yeah. Aggressive male, drunk and disorderly. We got Nick for in the end. Um, yeah, it was interesting. You always faff about with the cuffs at that point. You, yeah. you, you practice in training school so often, cuffing <laughs> people. And you just get like this. I don't know, you just, you just think, oh, I don't know how to cuff them. And you just <laughs> get this obsession with putting the cuffs on the wrist. So I really, really thought about it. It was really like, yeah, he was, uh, was flapping about, which didn't help. But um, yeah, it was an experience. It really was. Um, they're awesome. stuff that stick me for life, you know, not in there no longer. But they are good life experiences for sure. Great stuff. So you, you obviously just joined as a police officer. You're starting to recognise these issues with, with being a police officer, uh, how long are you in the, the job before you start realising actually something's off here? 
Yeah, um, probably two. I probably started to highlight it once I came out of my probation two years in. Um, it wasn't long after that that I was thinking about what I was going to do. Um, I was I was knackered. I was I was drained. I wasn't fitting in anything else outside of police. Um, my relationships were going down the pan. My just I had no hobbies. I couldn't do my hobbies because I just didn't have time. Um, and it was a struggle. Um, and that's when I highlighted, do I want to do this for, for the rest of my life? And that was a question I had to ask myself at that point. How did your, you know, you mentioned like relationships suffered, et cetera. How, how did friends and family deal with that? Did they just put all with it or, you know, how did they respond to it? All? I guess, I guess they just went along with it. You know, it was my decision what I wanted to do. That was the choice I'd made to be a police officer. That's, that's how it worked for me. Um, my partner's always been very understanding, but it definitely still impacts on your relationship because you, you don't have weekends, you don't have the same time off necessarily, and, and you do miss things. You, know, you, get, you get knocked back on annual leave requests and stuff, and that impacts you. That does impact your general life and well-being. So it was those sort of times when you get leave rejected that really made me think, and really chipped away at me in the end, I guess. Mm. Was there a particular moment in the job where you thought, again, th- this is it, enough's enough? Did anything, you know, affect your mental health? Was there a particular situation with the job or anything like that where, you know, it, it almost like took forced you to take action because actually the problem's too big now? Yeah, my mental health was on the floor. Um, it really was on the floor. Um, I was getting terrible anxiety. Uh, yeah, not good at all. Not anything, not anything particularly with the job and the trauma of the job, but it was just wearing me down. Um, and I, I wasn't myself. And uh, yeah, I went off, I ended up having to go off with it. Um, just the strain of it all was, uh, was taking its toll. So I went off and um, went on, I was on sick on, you know, and that's when I found you, when I was actually on in that period. And uh, I reached out to you and just wanted to find out more about it. And um, I didn't get any support from the job. And that's the problem. I think good officers, good experienced officers don't get the support they need. And if they did, they might still be there, but they don't. Mm. Um, and that was a real problem for me. And uh, I wanted to go into business and I wanted to do all this. And uh, there was no support there. It was almost, we'll come back, you know, do six months and then we'll look at a business request. Mm. Even though I was saying, actually, personal training is really helping me, you know, mm. just that's really benefiting me. I could actually do this alongside the job and I'd be quite happy. That wasn't, was never support there. And that was the time where I said, well, all right then, I'm going to go. I'm going to go and do this, you know. Enough is enough and I'm not going to, I'm not going to be dictated to it. It almost felt like that at that time. Um, It was sad. It was sad because I enjoyed the job. I felt I was good at the job. And yeah, that treatment just, it just made me sad. I wasn't happy, like, to leave was just uh yeah sadness i guess mm. in the end oh yeah and, and you know i'm glad you put your mental health first because i think a lot of people don't in the job uh and do that long enough can cause serious damage you mentioned for you it came out in anxiety but that anxiety for you though in particular did that come out in you know on your rest days you're dreading going back did it come after you nick someone where you're thinking about the situation after that or was it anxiety with what's coming up next you know what's that next job that's going to come in for you how did that anxiety come out was you staying up at late at night was you having any issues elsewhere talk to me a bit about that yeah i mean rest days were impacted because they would just go you know my last rest day i would be miserable just miserable at the fact that i was facing six six like shifts on and yeah, it impacted me. I, I really didn't want to go back. I'd, I'd wake up that night, just check my alarm to be up at the crack of dawn. You know, I just, I didn't want to go in. And that just made my health mentally it's horrible, really. Um, yeah, that's when I got it the worst. That was um, on that last rest day, for sure. Yeah. And when you spoke to, obviously, supervisors in the job, you know, I'm, I'm struggling here. What was kind of the reaction that you got? Uh, mixed, to be fair. I just... I just never got anyone to sit down. It just it was always the, the standard answer. It was never, I just never felt the support that I needed to get through it. And even when I was off, 
I didn't feel like I was being checked in on. I felt like I was just sitting at home and everything was going on without me, as it would, as it does. You are just a number. You really are just a number. And it's sad to say that you are. Um, and it just went on. You know, I didn't get checked in on. It was any check-in was sort of just a tick box exercise almost, I guess. Um, mm. Mm. And then, you know, when I thought about coming back and stuff, I said, oh, you know, I'd love to do this personal training alongside it when I come back. The response there just wasn't supportive. It was uh, do six months. Then, you know, if your attendance is good in them six months, then we'll have a look at it. But actually, I needed that to be able to pull me back up and, um, and give me some incentive and something away from the job to focus on. You know? mm felt which took a bit of weight off my shoulders I guess but the decision wasn't the rationale or that I would have expected I guess yeah so you recognize this point obviously you have an anxiety you're feeling something's off issues are happening you ask support from the job you feel like you're not getting it um when you are going through the situation and, and you know you have an anxiety it's coming out when do you click on or realize actually uh fitness pt in is actually making me feel uh really good about myself is that was that like an instant thing or was it like a gradual thing fitness i mean fitness saved me on the front line to be fair it saved me that was what kept me ticking shift to shift the gym it was a, ha- a powerful habit and the only habit i had the only consistency i had in my life which would make me feel good would clear my mind out and i could get on with my shift and go into my shift that was what kept me ticking through. And I, I knew how hard, how, how powerful that habit was, but how hard it is to form on the front line. Um, and that's what that's what brought me to the PT. And um, I find real value out of helping people with their fitness because I know how powerful it is. It's not just about your looks in the mirror. It's the mental aspects of it that's so powerful and life-changing. So, yeah, that's what brought me to think about the fitness industry. Fantastic. So at this point, obviously you've recognized now, you know, you want to go into the your fitness industry even more. So supervisors and the job really aren't supporting that. Um, what happens next, Jamie? Um, obviously because I didn't support it, I had a decision to make, you know, I'd, um, I had to close down what I'd done in the background and sort of carried on with, I was told I need to close it down, shut it down, liquidate what I'd done get rid of it and come back or don't come back and do it. That was the decision that I had no, no other decision to make. And um, I just wasn't, I just wasn't up for being held against that. I thought I, I literally, I live once and that's what I'm going to do. You know, it's going to be stressful because I had no, no plan at that point, really. Um, you know, I'd invested in, in you guys, but I didn't know what that was going to take me at that point. Mm-hmm. You know, not not really you know, I trusted in you but I've spoke to you at once or twice I didn't know um but I thought that's what I had to do even if it didn't work get another job and cr- progress in another career what's the worst that could happen right so, so when that happens obviously the supervisor said no come back or don't come back and start and you know stay with your business you make a decision to obviously stay with your business when you tell your supervisors okay I'm leaving how did that go down? Because, you know, for anyone listening on the podcast, uh, I'm going to say it, that takes some big balls. And uh, for you to stick to your dream, stick to your business and stick to your vision, that takes a certain type of character, especially at this point in your business. You weren't, you know, you weren't making thousands or anything like that at this point. You were quite new to it all. And still you stuck to your own guns uh, and your vision. How did that go down with? your supervisors shock complete shock i guess um across the board um colleagues just surprised just you know baffled i guess nothing what can do you know just they couldn't contemplate someone making that decision um just wasn't in there let's be honest i hadn't even i was only working in the background i hadn't even got public with like any of the business stuff i made a sale and I didn't have a tested business just just an idea um but I wasn't going to be held over a barrel about something that I actually believed in that was actually making me feel mentally better 
there was, there was no, it was an easy decision for me. It really was. My mental health and how I feel is much more important than any job. Amazing. And, and that's really inspirational, mate. I'm glad you made that decision. Um, what, what kind of comments did you get from your colleagues? Was it like, what about the pension or, you know, what about, you know, what are you going to do? Was there anything like that that come through the conversations at all? So I, I never, I never actually went in the pension. I was always, I was always of the same opinion as you are with the pension, Alex. And uh, I'd made this decision to, as it was. So that was never an issue for me. But there was always a case of what are you going to do, you know? And yeah, people, people say they support you, but there's, there's people out there that want to fail because they're, they're almost envious of the decision you've made to go into business and actually do it. And they don't want it to work because then it's almost a, this is what you could have done. Mm. This is where you could be if it works to them. So there's, there's people looking on, there's people looking on my social media still that it's almost like fake clapping, you know, that they're watching, but they're not watching because they want it to work. They're watching because they want to see that decision to almost come back in my face. So mm. it's an interesting one, but yeah. Yeah. Crabs in a bucket, you know, I explained. Yeah, exactly. Put crabs yeah. in a the bucket, they try and grab you back down, right? Yeah, 100%. Awesome stuff. So uh, at this point, you're going through this anxiety situation. You've got this business setting up. Uh, people in the police aren't supporting you, and you make uh, a gutsy move to obviously leave the police and, and go into business. Um, and I can remember one of your first uh, businesses uh, was to help uh, skinny men build muscle. And uh, I can remember myself and the team, we, we've got a team WhatsApp group and we was talking about you, Jamie, and was really impressed with how quickly you built your Facebook group. But not only that, how quickly you actually started making sales with that business. Uh, talk to me through about that business and, and what kind of gave you the inspiration to, to start with skinny men building, uh, building muscle. Yeah, it's funny because I've just told you I was an overweight child, but actually I ended up flipping the other way. Um, when I was about 15, 16, I ended up getting really skinny and struggling to put weight back on. It was <laughs> odd. Um, yeah. My genetics have just, just changed. You know, I've developed and changed. Um, and I struggled to put, to put muscle on um, for a long time. Um, and, the, you know, there's a body type, an exomorph body type, really struggled genetically to gain weight. Uh, and that's, that's what I wanted to go into. You know, I was, I was coming from a place where I had similar experiences. And, um, yeah, I thought great business idea you know I thought I'm re I was really in on it and uh I still you know I made my first sale I made the sale to a guy in the states in America and uh, that was my first sale you know, <laughs> incredible um and I made sales of it and uh, to be honest if I continued running with it I probably had a business there there probably is a business there for anyone listening and you haven't got a business idea there's a business there yeah. um but I just didn't stick with it long enough. Yeah, you make mistakes in business and uh, they're not yeah. mistakes, they're learning, they're learning points. But yeah, very good that point. was one for me, for sure. Very, very good point. Um, so then you decided to pivot and for anyone uh, listening or watching, Jamie, which he hasn't mentioned yet, is a phenomenal golfer. Now I'm very envious of you, Jamie, because <laughs> my handicap's like 28 or something ridiculous. First of all, before we go on to the business stuff, what is your handicap? I'm now 11, so 11. I'm not quite in single figures yet. Oh, that's the goal, single figures. Amazing stuff. So uh, the next kind of question is, you know, you obviously you pivot into a different idea. Um, and if you want to explain what that idea is. Yeah, so myself and Darren, who's part of the Ships of Success members, we had a, another good idea, you know, it was um, we'd looked into it and uh, we built it up. It was basically to help golfers with their flexibility, especially golfers who experience lower back pain. And again, if anyone's listening, there's a business there. There really <laughs> is. But I was going through this time where I just didn't have any clear direction and didn't stick with anything long enough. Um, so we did that. Uh, I didn't, we didn't stick for it long. We didn't let it run its course. Um, and yeah, I quickly pivoted again. You there. did pivot again. And do you want to explain what people uh, to the people what you do now? Yeah, so now I run the Frontline Fitness Academy and um, I help serving police officers pass their fitness test day, alleviate anxiety and lose weight. And uh, yeah, it's great. You know, stuck, stuck with it, dug in and um, 
I get so much value from it, honestly. Just, uh, yeah. I'm working with people, like-minded people as well, who I really understand. You know, I've been there, I understand it, and uh, it's great. It's great. Yeah, it, it really is. So the third third business idea is the charm. Um, <laughs> and obviously you've got background in the police, which which helps. But I've noticed, Jamie, on like your Instagram, on I'm seeing stuff inside your Facebook group. You know, people are saying you changed, you've changed their life. They feel more confident. They're... You know, they feel like uh, they've got their mojo back. Um, how does that make you feel that, you know, you're, you're making that impact in people's lives? Yeah, amazing. I mean, I feel like I'm the support mechanism that should be there across the board in the forces, but just isn't. Um, and yeah, just providing that value and hearing that makes everything worth it. It's a value I've never had in any other aspects of my life. So it's, it's great. Amazing stuff. And for those who may not be in the police, this, this podcast episode, uh, or maybe even those in the police, what kind of problems do you, you know do your clients come to you with? You know, you mentioned the bleep test there or the fitness test. Is there any other problems that that you tend to find cops are coming to you with? Yeah, so the bleep test is a big one. Um, there's lots of anxiety around the bleep test. Um, the older officers get their fitness levels aren't as great, and um, if you fail the bleep test, you've got sort of <laughs> ways that the force will impact you and um, make life tough for you which is obviously going to make your anxiety levels even higher so there's pressure on passing um, and it's not an easy test for many people um, so we work with we work with officers on that that's part of our product and the other product is we just help serving officers with their day-to-day -day life and their day-to-day -day fitness and nutrition on the front line you know um, stuff that is really difficult because you can easily neglect your health on the front line because you're busy and it's demanded yeah it's freaking dangerous right like if you're not in top peak condition and you've got you know a big lad or a big female you've got to be able to handle that situation until backup arrives or, or someone right and i think you know do you, do you feel like that's been lost over the police sometimes yeah definitely definitely that's um that culture of being in top condition has, has gone but i guess that's because the job is demanded um, and nutrition and actually building those habits isn't easy um, mm. because, you, you know, our police officers tend to lack the time to, to do it. They're tired, they're exhausted. And the last thing they want to do is go to the gym, but actually their fitness and going to the gym gives them the energy to then do other stuff. It clears their mind, mm. gives them the energy and focus to think about other things in their life. So mm. and it's made you feel better, right? When you was going through that hard time. So saved me you know it saved me um and if i can give that to other people and sort of turn their lives around through fitness and health and just them feeling better about themselves then that's great amazing stuff so talk to me about the, the bleep test obviously the bleep test is a, a big thing uh to pass the bleep test what level do you have to pass yeah so standard officers 5.4 um which you know when i when i ran it i, I never thought about it like like that you know, I just run it it's fine not an issue but there's lots of people mm. who that really is an issue for um mm. their health isn't at the top of their condition they're not you know they haven't prioritized the fitness and stuff in the build up to it um because they've sort of been probably been beat down by the job and other scenarios in their life and um there's pressure on passing it so you know we we put the strategies in place mentally and physically to be able to for someone to unlock them barriers and uh, and get through it. Amazing stuff. And he's, you know, if a if a police officer doesn't pass the bleep test, do they get a second chance and a third chance? You know, what's the kind of process of them not passing? Yeah, they do get they do get other chances. They get put on um, sort of a almost a disciplinary route. So if they don't pass it, they go up the stage on the disciplinary route. Um, I, don't, I haven't heard of anyone being sacked for not passing it, but yeah, there is pressure too. You get taken off frontline duties. Um, you then back office until you pass. And that's all horrible stuff. You know, it's, mm. it's not nice. Um, that makes people feel pretty naff with themselves. And uh, yeah, and the anxiety only goes up from there. You fail it once, your anxiety levels are through the roof to pass it the second time. So it can yeah. just get worse and worse and escalate. Yeah, the pressure's on, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about. You know, you mentioned like you help with the mindset, um, the fitness, nutrition. Talk to me about kind of your process of, you know, without sharing too much of your secrets, uh, how you would help police officers who may be struggling with their fitness test to actually get the result you want. Because I've seen you achieve it 
many times over with your clients. How, how do you how do you do that? Yes, yeah, it's quite simple, really. We structure it into three components, and if all the three of them components blend together, then we're on to a winner. Um, first and foremost, you have to look after the mental side. So we we're big on mindset, getting people in the right mindset to then do the other two pillars of what we do, which are nutrition, looking at their health, looking at their nutrition, looking at what they eat, seeing if maybe they can reflect and think, well, if I am overweight, actually losing weight is going to help me run this test. So let's look at that. How are you going to lose weight? How, that, how does that look? And then the third one is the fitness program. But that comes last. You know, you have to get your mindset and your nutrition on point before you put your trainers on and start a fitness program. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So, yeah, they're the three, they're the three pillars of what we do um, in that order. It has to be that order for it to work. Makes sense. And of course, this always comes up a lot of the time, you know, even in my gym and stuff. Very basic. Could you explain how do you actually lose body fat, Jamie? I think there's a lot of, for whatever reason, the conflicts and advice out there. Uh, from yourself, professional, quite simply, how do you lose body fat? Yes, yeah, so you need to burn more calories than you use it. So you need to be in a calorie deficit. It's quite simple. You need to be eating less. And that is it. It's no, it's no fad diet. It's no um, juice diet. It's a simple equation of burn more calories and be in a calorie deficit um, below your maintenance level. So work out your numbers, work out what your maintenance level is and eat less than your maintenance level. And if you do that, you lose weight. Mm. What do you think is one of the uh, biggest myths that you've, you find that you come across or just, you know, you probably you don't scroll on TikTok or Instagram. You just think, that's bullshit. What, what kind of, you know, what kind of advice have you come across where you think, Jesus Christ, people are soaking this stuff up? Well, there's so, there's so many, isn't there? There's, I guess it's the equipment people sell um, and people buy, surprisingly. Um, the worst one's got to be the things that strap around your stomach and vibrate to help get you abs. People buy that. You know, people actually buy that and think, I'll strap this on and that'll get rid of my body fat and give me a six pack. It's uh, the problem is people do look for quick wins. They look for the easy. It's easy. It's an easy sell because it's telling them exactly what they want to hear. You get six pack in two weeks of strapping this on, pressing the button and watching TV. Easy, right? Um, that's not quite how it works. No, people want the easy route, right? Yeah, always. Yeah. It's just human nature, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So. Since obviously you've you've left the police, you've 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 uh, tried a few business ideas. You've found this third one. You're impacting people's lives. You're changing people's lives. You're feeling valued. Um, how do you feel now um, compared to where you was? Free. I feel free. Um, life has completely changed. Um, I I miss I miss aspects of the police as in the, the actual job and parts I enjoyed. Mm. You know, there are parts that I do miss, but. In general, I've got my freedom. Um, my mindset is better. My mental health is better. I control most of my days. It's, uh, it's, it's rewarding. It's been it's been a zigzag journey, but business is a zigzag journey. And I think those who stay the course and don't get thrown off when things aren't going right are the ones that win at the end. Mm. Um, yeah, and it's you know I've been not even two years, Alex. So it's you have loads of zigzags, but in the context of things, two years is nothing to get where I am now. So, yeah. yeah. And we're, we're very, very proud of you. With regards to you joining Shift Success, coming across me, first of all, how did you find me? Yeah, so I did reach out to you guys before I joined way back and then didn't do anything about it. So it was in the back of my mind. I'm not quite sure how that works or how I found you initially, but then it was in the back of my mind when things weren't going well. I was looking at what I wanted to do. I always want to be in business. I thought, let's reach out. I think I emailed you directly. Just said, can I fix up a chat? And we went from there. Um, I looked into what you did and I had a chat with you. And it was the right thing. I invest in people, to be honest with you. And I have throughout, you know, golf. I invest in the golf coach who's going to bring me forward. But it's always the person I invest in. And to me, you were the, you were the right person to bring me forward. Um, and it, it works. It was a good investment. So, yeah. <laughs> good. I'm glad. What's some of the, uh, what's one of the biggest like business lessons you've had since joining Shift Success that you could share with people listening to the podcast or, or watching the podcast? Aggressive patience. Um, 
yeah, aggressive patience. What I mean by that is, is it takes time. You have to build an audience. You need to build that brand. You're not just to get sales straight off the bat, but you also need to be doing the things to be able to build your audience. So if you're sitting there and thinking, well, no one's, no one's interested. You know, I'm posting this content. No one's looking at it. This business won't work. Let's change. That's, that's wrong. Don't do that because you haven't given it enough time and you need to be implementing and building your audience for people to watch and then absorb and then you'll get sales. But you have to be patient, aggressive patience. Awesome. Great lesson. Um, what's some been your top wins since being in business, joining Shift Success? Uh, the first sale I made to a guy in the United States on Zoom was pretty good. Um, yeah. Did you have think- sales experience before? No, none. No, that was that was just that was incredible. Um, I think I ran around the house three times. <laughs> Amazing. I, I thought this is. Do you know what? I did think this is it though. If I can do it once, I can do it millions of times, and you really can. Yeah, you do it once, you prove to yourself you can do it, and that's all I needed to be to give me the perseverance and the belief to do it. Um, so that was massive. That's definitely number one. And uh, yeah, I mean recently. It's been incredible. Just the results people are getting from the product that I've designed has been inspirational. But um, yeah, they're, them two are massive for me, definitely. Awesome. And what kind of uh, from, from your how was you in the how uh, long was you in the police in total? Sorry. Um, so it would have been just over four and a half years, I think, cool. in total. Okay. So that's from the control room officer and an officer. Yeah. So not not a long period of time. Just. I like the early doors to the yes yeah, same as me i was about four and a half as well for you what kind of skill sets do you believe you've transferred from being a police officer into your own business because i think a lot of people listen to this or you know watching this for whatever reason i've noticed it with the conversations i have with cops and my team has with cops every single month they just don't believe in themselves and you know i would i wouldn't have started the company if i didn't believe that police officers had these these skill sets that are undervalued for you what kind of skill sets have you transferred into your business that allowed you to change your life? Yeah, communication is massive. You, you deal with the most difficult situations, the most intense situations that other people don't get exposure to. And you sit and you can take statements with distressed victims. and All of this stuff you do day in, day out. So you can take a Zoom call with someone across, across the world talking about products you believe in, you know, you, you're in that position your communication is great you can interact with people you've done all that you're doing it day to day and i think communication is key in business if you can speak to someone express your feelings and gain that trust that you need then yeah you're on to a winner but yeah it's uh people don't believe in themselves you're right even though they deal with really stressful abnormal situations that the normal person doesn't deal with in their life amazing what's your kind of vision for the future where do you see your uh, frontline fitness academy going in the future where do you want it to be yes i was asking myself this the other day actually um i, I want to be i want to definitely be reached out in the uk and be well known I think building my audience up building that that sort of tribe almost people who have got results and will then refer to other people who are struggling is massive for me so i just want to be known you know throughout the UK in every force that there is somewhere to turn with if you're struggling with the bleep test and you're anxious about the test we can get you through it and we will get you through it and um and if you're just in general just feeling you know fatigued exhausted feeling naff about yourself you know rubbish about yourself and you're in a bit of a hole we're there to pick you up we're there to give you some powerful habits to actually change your perception of how you see yourself give you that boost, make you feel more self-confident and um, give you the energy back in your life. Awesome stuff. What, uh, if anyone likes starting out, let's say they're in your position, Jamie, and they're, or, or were in, or sorry, the position you were in, yeah. anxiety, they feel like this job is a safe haven. They've got maybe the pension, they've got a salary, they're in a predictable cycle. So that is a comfort zone. They think about the bills and the mortgage. They're thinking about, uh, the worries of leaving potentially uh but they do want change they know they're in a bad situation they've got anxiety they know not really they don't want to spend 30 years in the job 
but they're worried about starting their business. What kind of advice, you know, because you've been with us, you know, approaching two years, I believe. What, what kind of advice would you give uh, to someone who maybe wants a positive change, but they're just a bit reserved because they've got this security around them? Yeah, I mean, everyone's situation is different, right? Um, what works for me might not work for someone else. The circumstances might be different. I was just at a time in my life where, you know, I could do that. Um, but if you're not at that point where you could just afford to just leave the job, then just get started. Just try to build something on the side, you know, start developing that and build it alongside your work. And eventually, if you do it well and consistent enough, then that's going to eventually get you out of the job. So if your circumstances don't allow you to just drop everything and go into a business where you have no certainty, build it alongside it to build up the confidence for you then to replace your job and leave the job. Um, I think that's massive. So, yeah. Awesome. What makes uh, Jamie feel inspired? Knowing you're having one of those down days, Jamie, or, you know, one of those days where it's like, what, what makes you feel inspired? That I have one life and the clock is always ticking. Um, and I don't want, I want to be remembered for something. I want to leave some sort of legacy behind. And every day I have a chance to move that forward. Um, and I'll, yeah, that, that is it as such. What, what do you want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered for actually giving value in people's lives. And if I can do that in police and give value there and be remembered in that, that industry, then great. Amazing. What, um, Let's rewind things. What, what's kind of a business lesson, or in fact, a life lesson that if you could rewind the clock and speak to your 18-year-old self, what advice would you give 18-year-old Jamie about the upcoming years? Um, start investing earlier would be one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that would be one. Um, so I guess, I guess I'd have liked more direction and more... Um, more certainty of what I wanted to do. I just it just was muddled. I was always muddled and didn't have that direction. If I'd have had the direction earlier, then I'd probably be in a lot better place. Um, so just just some clarity on where I wanted to go with my life. But that's that's life, isn't it? You don't always get that early doors. Sometimes that takes time to come out. Absolutely. And um, if you had an opportunity to have a dinner party, you can invite three people, dead or alive. Who would you invite and why? Um, there's a guy called Greg Plitt. He's, he's dead now. I don't know if you know. I know Greg. Like I know him very well. Yeah, he got me into fitness. Yeah. Did he? He got me into fitness. We've got some spooky stuff, Jamie. That's another conversation we need to have <laughs> <Yes>. another time. <laughs> yeah. Greg Plitt's an, an amazing person. He's a but mm -hmm. His motivation is incredible. Um, I'd love just to be in a room with him. The energy he gave gives off is incredible. So... Craig Flit would be one, um, two, two, two. Oh, this is tough. Um, oh, this is tough. Probably Mick McCarthy. Um, okay. Football, football. Um, yeah. Very interesting man. Um, I'm a big Ipswich Town fan, so I'd love to know what his time was like when he was manager of Ipswich. And um, three, probably Robert Kiyas. Is that who? Pillar. Yes, that's for me. Kiyosaki. Robert Kiyosaki. Again, tongue-tied. Rob Kiyosaki. Um, I, yeah, I've done a lot of studying on, on Robert and what he's done in his life. And I think he has some powerful lessons. I think if more people implemented in their life, especially with their money, they've been in a much better situation. So I'd love to just pick his brains. Amazing stuff. Jamie, um, where can people find... Uh, you've got a phenomenal Facebook group. It's growing daily. The content you put in there, I'm in it. Uh, the content you put in there is phenomenal. Uh, it's inspiring and I see all the people who are gaining massive wins in your community. What is your uh, Facebook community call for the listeners on the podcast? Yeah. So it's, it's now changed. It's now um, just two seconds. I've just literally changed it. It's um, fleet test and weight loss support for serving police officers. Fantastic. And, yeah. And our, yeah. our fitness page is frontline fitness Academy, which is our business page, but most of our value comes in the community group amazing stuff and what we'll do guys leave the link below this video um jane one of the last things that i want to ask you uh, and i ask everyone who comes onto the show is what does entrepreneurship mean to you jamie freedom it means being in charge of 
what I want to do with my life um, and freedom, more time to drive value into people's lives, more, more headspace. Yeah, freedom. Amazing stuff. Jamie, you've absolutely been amazing. I just want to say as well, uh, look, we're glad you joined Shift Success. You've inspired us, the community, um, and I can't wait to see uh, what unfolds for your future. You're making a positive impact, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to see your business grow, and I'm glad you're feeling a lot better about, uh, about life. Uh, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you're watching inside the Facebook group, uh, if you've got any uh, questions from myself or Jamie, then, of course, reach out to us. Uh, it'll be on the uh, podcast audio on Apple and all the other outlets uh, next week. So if you want to catch up, you can do that. And uh, of course, if you want to join Jamie's Facebook group, please do check out the comments on the video. He's going to be dropping a link. So if you're a police officer, you've got some worries about the bleep test or fitness, definitely join his group. Jamie, thank you so much for your time and uh, congratulations on all your success so far. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.